uh, welcome to those of you that are here in Phoenix. We're always very glad that you're joining us. For those of you that are watching us online, apps, Roku, or YouTube, we're glad you're with us today. If you want to know more about our ministry, go online to womensbiblestudy.com. We have handouts for all of the lessons. We are in the middle of a series in the um, book of Revelation called The Clock is Ticking. For those of you that are keeping track through um, our actual Revelation series, this will be lesson 22, but it will be the second session in a whole separate series that we've got with our author and speaker, guest uh, Joel Richardson, so we're super happy to have him here. Um, if you haven't heard him, the first series, go, or first session, go back to uh, just skip two lessons before and you'll, you'll see us there. Um, he's helping me make it through... Uh, Revelation, because he's way smarter than me. Uh, if you want to know about his ministry, go to joelstrumpet.com, and he has lots and lots of videos on there that are really, really fascinating, and you have a lot of guest speakers that come on from Egypt and all over the world, actually. It's kind of fun. Uh, we do the books here, Mideast Beast, uh, God's War on Terror, When a Jew Rules the World, Mystery Babylon, Mount Sinai, and the Mystery of Catastrophe. Those are his books that he's written. Um, he stays up on the Middle East so he knows biblically what's going on. It's kind of awesome. So um, I want to play a video because today for this session we're going to talk about Mystery Babylon. Um, I'm not going to say much. I'm just pretty much, we're going to do verses. He's going to talk verses. He's going to talk because he wrote a whole book on it so he specializes in this and I don't. But it's, it's clearly fascinating. Um, I, I want to play this video really quick. Of This was the inter a video of your... Um, I think, hold on a second. Hang on, David's gonna get that. How long did it take you to write Mystery of Babylon? Mystery of Babylon, well, I mean, I, in a sense, I was working on it for like 10 years, but that's, I would work on it and put it away, work on it and put it away. But when I actually finally sat down, it, I did it pretty quickly, a few months. Okay. That's because I had been pondering it for so long. Yeah, well, because you saw, it, it's more too of, a, of how the world is going, you're seeing things. Okay, we'll watch this. Wow, like whoever put that together. That I haven't was seen that in a while. That's awesome. pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was really good. Kind of impressed with that. Um, okay, so let's talk about this whole Mystery Babylon thing. It's a Revelation 17, 17 and 18. Um, you kind of have a theory, so should we just read a few verses and then we'll just kind of go from there? Um, or do you want to talk about it ahead of time? Let me say a couple things real quick. So Revelation 17 and 18 is the longest prophecy in the whole New Testament. And as we'll see, it concerns this woman. She's both a queen and a prostitute. She's, dr she's got this cup. She's drunk on the blood. It's, it's actually horrible. She's a prostitute and it says she has a cup filled with the blood of the saints 
and the filth of her prostitution. And she's getting the nations drunk on this. And you know, it's just this horrible, gruesome picture. You will never ever hear a pastor preach on these, these chapters on Sunday morning. You know, like this is not, you're not gonna get this in church, but yet here's the thing. Because one, it's just strange, they don't know what to do. That Here's the thing, it makes up a couple of the final chapters of the whole Bible. And ultimately the angel comes along, and we'll talk about it in detail, and he explains that it is a geopolitical power that would have predominance in the earth in the last days. So it's actually very relevant. It's not just some weird prophecy. And I think if we're living in the last days that it's something that we should talk about and that we should look at and try to get a grid on what is the Bible saying because I think it actually is one of the more relevant issues um, of our day, so. Um, when I, I, the last session we were talking about when I was talking to my sister and my brother-in-law and she just said, Lisa, why, is, why has nobody ever told us this? Why is nobody teaching us these things? And like, just why, why won't pastors pick this up? Is it just to, to what? To... They don't like talking about prostitutes. No, um, <laughs> no I, you know, it's just Sunday is like, Sunday, let's talk about how to be a better husband and a family. You know, it's just, I will say this, um, the subject of the end times, you know, there's a lot of goofiness that can be attached to it. Right. And so I think some of the reaction against it is probably justified. Um, but the thing of it is, is that when we don't teach on subjects that the Bible teaches on, then what happens? The crazies take it over. Mm -hmm. And we can't just let the fringe and the crazies take over subject and say, this is our purview as responsible shepherds and teachers and pastors, we need to work through this information and help the church to understand it. So I'm saying this publicly, so just because I'm gonna put a Joel on the spot. But last night we talked about it and I'm like, you know what, Joel, this is frustrating, Rob and I, because it's like we, we really want it to get into the churches. We need to teach this stuff. So I said, what if we did like an eight week video where you guys could take the videos into your neighborhood and your families and teach this and, and have it to where from the beginning to the end so, you, so we can get this message out there because we have to know what's coming. And th that picture up there, uh, was terrifying of the, the square with, okay, explain Kabul. what that is. So in the center of the city of Mecca, which is of course the heart of the spiritual heart of Islam. Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia, yeah, on the west coast of Saudi Arabia, the south, south central west coast is um, this thing called the cube in Arabic, Kaaba. And it's actually 60 feet tall, 60 feet wide, 60 feet, you know, 60 by 60 by 60. And um, it's just, it was something that was built and sort of rebuilt over the years. When Muhammad came along, it was, it was uh, uh, filled with idols. And then he purged it of 360 idols and now it is only place to worship his God known as Allah. And, um, and then interestingly on the corner of it is embedded a meteorite and it's sort of encased in silver and they all go up and kiss it and touch it. And what's interesting is that this is a carryover of very ancient Middle Eastern paganism. Um, a lot of the idols that you'll find of Diana and Artemis, the faces, the heads are carved out of black meteorite. And there's even references in the book of Acts. Great is, some will say Diana, some will say Artemis. Great is Artemis, great is Diana in Ephesus whose image fell from heaven, whose face as part of the idol was a meteorite. And so this is actually a carryover of ancient paganism. They all touch it and kiss it. And like I always said, but there's nobody there, you know, like the guy on my big fat Greek wedding, spraying it with Windex. <laughs> because then what happens is, is everyone goes to the, to the, the Hajj, or the pilgrimage, and then the flu spreads all over the world every year. It's like one of the biggest conduits of the flu. Because unlike the Catholic church who uses alcohol, which, kills the germs, <laughs> they, just, they don't have that anyway, side note. But for those that are germaphobes, that just adds to the horror. How many people go to that thing? That, that was a big... It's the single most visited site in the world. It's the single most visited city in the world, nothing. Well, um, Paris and London come close, but it is the single most visited spot in the whole world. And you have to think about this, 1.8 billion Muslims, you've got 7 point something billion people in the earth, 1.8 billion Muslims in the earth, five times a day bowing toward that Kaaba. It is the single greatest center of idolatry that mankind has ever even come close to producing. 
So that's an important sort of factor as we begin to talk about this. Ah, we gotta get this message out, Joel. Uh, all right, uh, verse one and two. Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality. Those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. You just tell me when you wanna stop. Okay, let's, we'll go hit that. Immorality is fornication. It is, the angel explains a lot of this later, but it is any, it, it, it's an, a metaphor for worship and it's false worship. Anyone who worships anyone other than the God, their, the one true God, their creator, the God of the Bible is committing fornication, acts of immorality. So this woman, this great prostitute, this woman, great harlot, what is this calls her the great harlot, um, is someone who seduces the world into engaging in false worship systems. Okay. Uh, verse, what are we at? Three out there. Uh, let's see. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. Uh, that's kind of what we just saw that too earlier. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold. Um, I'm, I'm trying to keep... I can't read from here and there, so. Just go from here and then. But I need to keep changing it. Uh, what am I at, four? Uh, with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a cup, a gold cup full of abominations and the unclean things of her immorality. And uh, on her forehead name was written a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Okay, so first of all, the angel says, come, I'm gonna show you this woman. And then I was taken away in the spirit into a wilderness. Now, the word there, wilderness, in the Greek is eremon or eremos, which means desert. In the Middle East, a wilderness is a desolate place, void of, of uh, population, you know, a haunt of desert jackals. Owls. It's, this is not, when we see wilderness, we think Sarah Palin's backyard. Right, trees, a big forest. Wilderness is a desert. I was taken into a desert, and there I saw this woman, and she's she's riding. She's in partnership with the the, the coming Antichrist coalition. So this is they they are a team. This is the Lone Ranger and Silver. You know, this is not. So they're they're they initially are portrayed as partners. Um, and then she's decked out in scarlet and purple. This is the color of royalty and it's the color of sin. So not only is she a prostitute, she's also a queen. She's presenting herself as a queen and she's decked out in all kinds of precious stones and pearls and so forth. So she is decking herself out in all of the luxuries of the world. And now this is interesting because again, we look at it and there's so much symbolism and it's so difficult initially. We go, what in the world is the Bible even talking about here? And then is written across her forehead. It's like, I tell this story, and it's a terrible story, but when I was in high school, before I became a Christian, and we all skipped school, and um, one of my, you know, we got drunk at my friend's house, and so one of my friends passed out. And so we got my friend's sister's makeup and, and um, did him up, you know, real horrible. We made him look like a prostitute, but then we wrote drunk, across his forehead. Then we woke him up and said, your dad called, your dad called, you're gonna go home, you're, you're in trouble. And he, and he woke up and ran home. <laughs> Drunk. So when he walked in the door, it was very clear. <laughs> Drunk. So what the Lord did is he goes, look guys, I know you're all dumb and I know this is very confusing, but I'm gonna make it very clear. He writes it across her forehead. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And we go, well, what's that? Well, like, what in the world? And he goes, I wrote it across her forehead. What does this mean? Okay, within the biblical narrative, Babylon the Great was the prototype of which was the ancient city of Babylon. And this was the place that Israel was carried away to. It was the seductive city. It was the destroying city. They're the ones that destroyed Israel the first time and carried them, all, well, I mean, the, the Assyrians destroyed the Northern Kingdom, but in terms of Jerusalem and Judah, it was Babylon that did that. And then it says, the mother of all harlots. Now, this is um, a phrase which is a class classic Eastern expression. It doesn't mean 
we read this as Americans, we go the mother of harlots. And so this is what we picture. We picture a prostitute who is a mother of a whole bunch of little prostitutes, like little prostitutelets. (laughs) That's not what it's saying. She's not the mother of a whole bunch of prostitutes. She is, this is an Eastern expression, which just means the biggest. She's the big mama. She's the big mother of all prostitutes. Remember when Saddam Hussein said, come on over George Bush, it's gonna be the mother of all battles, mm-hmm. right? The, the biggest, that's what it means. It's just like a simple Eastern expression. And so it's not saying she gives birth to a bunch of prostitutes. So she is Babylon the great. She is the greatest of all Babylons. She is the greatest source of Uh, the greatest version, if you will, of an end time city that's opposed to the people of God. She is the greatest of all prostitutes. What is a prostitute? Again, someone who is worshiping someone other than God. It is the greatest of false religions. It's the greatest of all false religious systems and the greatest of all of the abominations of the earth. But what was the very first thing? Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot. So again, she is the great prostitute, the great harlot, the great Babylon. She is the supreme of all of these things. So all it's basically saying is the most significant, the biggest source of persecution and false religion that mankind has ever known. It's actually not that complicated. Once you weed through the symbolism, you go, oh, yeah, okay, that makes clear sense. Immorality is idolatry. Immorality is false worship. And he wrote it across her forehead. He s- literally spelled it out in big letters right across her forehead. And we just saw that in that video. That, that video just haunts me. Uh, verse six, um, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witness of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. Um, and then I saw the woman, I'm sorry. And the angel said to me, why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that, she carries, that carries her, which has the seven heads and the 10 horns. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. So again, there's two, again, when we look at these things and we try to analyze what it is, I always use this analogy. I say, look, the Bible gives us multiple criteria and we have to identify each of these criteria. So the first thing is it's the greatest false religion. The second thing is she's drunk with the blood of the saints and with the witnesses of Jesus, again, the martyrs of Jesus. So it is the primary entity that is responsible in the last days for the shed blood of the saints, of the people of God, again, both Jews and the witnesses of Jesus. And so that's criteria number two. So, you know, the the Lord's gonna give us a whole glove that we're gonna try to fit. And what happens as people try to identify the, the various interpretations, they say, well, is it the Vatican? Is it literal Babylon? Is it the Illuminati? Is it New York City? Is they, they try to fit the glove on and they go, oh, wow, well, look, two of the fingers really fit. And I go, that's wonderful. But you don't go to Target and, tr- well, you guys don't even buy gloves out here, do you? Um, <laughs> You don't buy, if you, if you did, theoretically, if you bought a pair of gloves, you don't try it on and say, wow, three fingers fit, great, I'm gonna buy it. You're looking for something where all the fingers fit. And this is so important as we move forward is we have to identify all the criteria and then say, of all the options, which one fits and meets all of the criteria? Because you don't buy a pair of gloves if two fit, great, but just you kind of ignore the other fingers. That's just not how it works. So the mystery Babylon and, and the Antichrist have this like thing. This Lone Ranger silver relationship, you know, and, and it's interesting too because she's all dressed in red. This, the beast is himself scarlet. So, you know, they're both, this is, you know, Sally and Mike are going bowling and they both have the same bowling jacket on, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're a team, they're out on date night. They're dressed the same and, or Lone Ranger, Silver, whatever analogy you wanna use, they are a partnership. And so this is what's interesting is the angel goes, look, why do you wonder? Like, first of all, he should have said, look, I understand that you're confused right now, John, and I understand that it's confusing, but let me explain it. And then he goes, I'm gonna explain the mystery of the woman And then he goes on and he describes the beast and he goes on for multiple verses and just talks about the beast. And so what I take from this is he goes, if you want to identify the woman, you have to first understand the beast. Okay. Who is this beast that she is riding, that she's in partnership with? And I think in the last session, we already did that. 
It's the last day's Islamic empire. Now, again, I want to be clear, guys. This is my opinion. I think it makes the most biblical sense. Am I saying pay no attention to Europe? Pay no attention to the Roman Empire? Pay no attention to any of these other guys that have different theories? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying pay attention to all of these things. But make sure we do pay attention to this. Because a lot of people, you know, as much as I'm laying out my case, you'll have these other authors that go, Joel doesn't know what he's talking about. But it largely is, in my opinion, um, and Lisa touched on it at the beginning, is we have a lot of people, including teachers, that are very good students of their teachers. They go to the seminary, their professor taught this. Ten years after being a pastor, after getting out of seminary, they write a book, and it's just they're quoting the same guys. You see this in academia. They all cite each other. And I'm not poo-pooing any of it. I'm just saying I'm offering an alternative perspective, and I think it meets and aligns with the biblical descriptions, the biblical criteria, and it just so happens to align with what we see unfolding in the earth right now. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying pay no attention to any of this other stuff. I'm saying just pay attention to this also. So in my opinion... One of the keys to identifying the woman is recognizing the beast is an Islamic, revived Islamic empire. Once we understand that, then we understand this woman that she's in partnership with, or this, this woman that the empire is in partnership with, that has this relationship at the onset, is going to be identifiable. It's going to be connected to Islam, is the point. Perfect. Okay, uh, let's see. What are we at here? What can I, eight to nine. Um, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. Those who dwell on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will wonder when they see the beast that he was, was and is not and will come. This is simply a reiteration of what we've already looked at. He will be and then he suffers the fatal head wound and he's not and then he comes back. And it says the people of the earth will wonder when they go, oh my gosh, this thing came back, this thing revived. And so it's just reiterating the same thing over again that began in Daniel 2 with the legs, that was reiterated in Daniel 7 with the beast, with the horns, that it was then emphasized again with the fatal head wound, and now it just says the same thing again. Uh, Verse 9 here is uh, the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And they are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, uh, one, the other has not yet come. When he comes, he must remain a little while. Now, uh, the first time I ever taught this, I, you know, most of the commentaries that I dealt with, was, this was Rome. And that's probably where most people get it from. But what is this? Okay, so here's the mind that has wisdom. It's saying, pay attention, I'm about to tell you a riddle. Apply wisdom to this. He says, the seven heads are seven mountains. You go, wait, what? Seven heads, seven mountains, on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Now, in history, people have said, well, Rome is the city on seven hills. It's interesting, there's two words, unos and bunos. One is hill, one is mountain. They're kind of similar, but the word here is actually mountains, not hills. Rome sits on seven hills. Here, it actually uses the word for mountain. It's subtly different. But the point is this, is it's not seven literal hills. Because that's why he says the seven heads are seven mountains, they are seven kings. An incredibly common symbol or motif throughout the Bible for a kingdom is a mountain. So he's saying the seven heads are simply seven kingdoms. They're also seven kings. See, that makes sense. Kings, kingdoms. And by the way, this interpretation of it not being seven hills This is something that's been embraced by scholars for a long time. Go back to John Walvoord's commentary on Revelation. He'll say the same thing. Walvoord used to be the dean of Dallas Theological Seminary. Most people no longer say that this has anything to do with Rome. It's just kind of a popular idea that still floats around, but most commentators, scholars, have long rejected that. And then here's the riddle. He goes, so we're dealing with seven kingdoms, seven empires. And then he says this, five have fallen... It was written in the first century. One is, and the other has not yet come. When he comes, he's going to remain for a short time. So, throughout the Bible, it tells the story of various satanic empires. As I said, Satan's primary way that he manifests in the earth is through pagan empires, pagan militaries. And so, from the very beginning of the biblical story, what was the pagan kingdom that emerged that was trying to wipe out the people of God? It was Egypt right? And then came Assyria, then came Babylon, then came Medo-Persia with Haman and all of this, then came Greece, 
Okay, Antiochus Epiphanes, five have been. The whole Bible, whole Testament is just the, the, the ebb and flow of these various pagan empires constantly trying to wipe out the Jewish people. And by the way, you have to understand, if you're Jewish, this is embroiled into your, your, your consciousness that through, throughout history, Satan has already, always stirred up somebody to try to wipe you out as a people. So again, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then he says one is. In the first century, that was Rome, right? Rome was the pagan empire of John's day. And then he goes, but another one's coming. One, one yet is. And the one that came after that, that carries the flow of all the previous ones, that, that has all of the same descriptions and the same spirit, the anti-Yahwistic spirit, you know, it's a, they're opposed to Yahweh or Jehovah, that is anti-Semitic, they, it, it had that anti that anti-Jewish, that hatred of the Jewish people, the anti-Zionism, the demonic lust to possess the land of God, and the anti-Christ spirit, it's Islam. Okay, now when it says he must remain for a little while, it's zeroing in on the antichrist. Because consistently, whenever it talks about the antichrist, it always defines his coming as a short time, a little while, just a, a brief period. In fact, just a few verses later, we'll see the beasts give their authority to him for one hour. That's an expression that just means for a little while. And so the woman is in sort of, she's present, she rules over all of these, you know, she's a spirit that controls all of these pagan empires throughout history. But here's the thing, if you say that Rome is, is mystery Babylon, the problem is Rome ends up becoming the fifth, I mean, I'm sorry, the sixth and the seventh. And then later we'll see that there's an eighth, which is there, there's that dual kind of thing again. Rome is the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth, and you just end up, it just doesn't work. So it works if you see that something did come after Rome. Rome, look, Rome, I'm a Protestant. I, I you know, disagree with Ro Roman Catholicism theologically on these various issues, but it's one thing to say, you know, I disagree with you on soteriology, on your understanding of how one comes to be saved. I believe salvation by grace through faith alone. It's one thing to say that. It's another thing to say, you are the embodiment of Satan. You are the great whore. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of hard to have a conversation once that comes out, right? And so I think we need to have a proper perspective. Yes, Roman Catholicism, it has theological issues that I disagree with. It's another thing to say that the, Pope Francis and his crew are about to start beheading people all over the earth. I think that's kind of a, a jump. Yet you'll still get plenty of people that will say that. I think there's something else in the earth that does meet the criteria quite well. And it's not the United States, apparently. Okay, so now a lot of people have said it's at Rome, United States, and all of these things. So again, Rome, you can make them fit a couple of the fingers, but when it comes to this bloodthirsty woman that is guilty for shedding the blood of the saints, specifically in the last days, because you can look back and say, well, during the Reformation, Catholicism was guilty for a lot of shed blood, but that's not the context of what it's saying. It's saying in the last days. And Pope Francis and his crew don't meet that criteria. Um, and there's a handful of other things there that they, it doesn't, the Rome just doesn't meet the criteria. Look, it says of the Antichrist spirit that he denies the Father, 1 John 2.22, he denies the Father, he denies the Son. Again, we can have all kinds of differences as Protestants, if, if, I mean, may have, maybe even have plenty of Catholics in the room, I don't know. But the point is this, Roman Catholicism, for anything that you might disagree with it on, has championed the doctrines of the Trinity, has championed the fatherhood of God and the sonship of Christ. You have to be honest. And, and Rome does not meet that criteria. You know, um, it was very popular for many years to engage in antichrist pointing. You know, no, you're the great harlot. No, you are. You're the whore. No, you're the system of the antichrist. No, you are. And I think, honestly, look, we've got Catholics, Orthodox, Coptics, and Protestants in the Middle East. I go to the Middle East a lot. I go to Iraq. I go to, I was just in Saudi Arabia. And I can tell you that it is anyone who names the name of Jesus is being persecuted for the name of Jesus. And then we have these Americans that go, yeah, but the Catholics are the real problem. I go, they're being beheaded for the name of Jesus alongside with their Protestant. We need to have a proper perspective. It's Islam that's doing it. Okay, so I don't believe that Rome meets the criteria. The United States, you can, people can say, oh, well, they spread corruption throughout the earth, you know. I go, okay, I can agree with that. But the United States is not a religion. 
It's not a false religious system. And for any shortcomings that we may have, we are still the greatest missionary sending force in the world. Amen. We still fund 80% of the global foreign missions comes from the United States. So for, you know, as opposed to being the primary entity that's responsible for the greatest form of false worship in the earth and the great the greatest entity responsible for the shed blood of the saints. We don't meet the criteria. We just don't. So that's a few of the reasons. We could talk about all kinds of other details as far as why they don't fit. Jerusalem um, is another one. People say, well, what about modern day Jerusalem? Again, it's not this great luxurious power player that controls the kings of the earth with their wealth. It just simply doesn't. We just recently had this controversy in the United States with the um, Minnesota Congresswoman Ilhan uh, Tamar um, from Somalia making anti-Semitic statements and she tweeted on her Twitter account saying APAC, American Israel Political Action Committee, is responsible for all of the Jews controlling American politicians. And she's fomenting an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Um, APAC is a very legitimate political lobby, lobbying group, but it's, you know, we have lobbyists. You could say, well, we disagree with lobbyists. Here's the thing. Saudi Arabia is the single greatest lobby power in Washington. Nothing even vaguely begins to come close. Okay, this one single family has poured more money into the back pockets of American presidents, congressmen, women, you name it, other than Saudi Arabia, no one even begins to come close. So Jerusalem is not this great influence over the kings of the earth. They're not responsible for the shed blood of the saints, etc., etc. So each of these various things, I think they just fail to meet the biblical criteria. Okay. Verse 11, um, the beast which was and is not um, is himself also the eighth and is, the, and is one of the seven and he goes to destruction. So let's park there for a second. So again, now here it says, remember, this is the beast that was and is not and comes back. Okay, so the fatal head wound, it, it disappears for a while and then it comes back and now it's reiterating the same thing. It is also an eighth and it's of the seven. You know, so here's all this riddle, but it's saying this is the one, it goes five have been, five, one is Rome, and then another one is the seventh. And then it says this beast that dies and comes back is also an eighth. So yes, it's the seventh, but also it's an eighth. So here again, it's just reiterating the same thing. There is another kingdom that would come after Rome and it would have two phases. It would have the historical phase and then it would have the final phase. So the eighth is the final phase. The eighth correlates to the feet of iron and clay. The seventh correlates to the legs of iron. The seventh correlates to the beast of Daniel 7. The horns correlate to the eighth. One empire, two phases. So yes, it's the seventh. Yea, it's the eighth. Oh, I'm glad you're teaching this. Can you come back next week so I can finish this out? And you can just teach the rest. And I'm doing acts. Can you just come teach acts for me? You should see when I go on a date with my wife. I'm like, honey, the beast, the horns. No, I'm just kidding. I don't talk about any of this stuff. Once I leave Phoenix, it just, I turn it off. I asked, I asked him because I said, wow, what do your kids think? Like, are they terrified? Do you, do you talk about it? You know, because my kids, they're just like, I just don't want Jesus to come back until I get married and have sex. So... <laughs> Yeah, I talk like that. And then they get married and they're like, come Lord Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. See, there you go. All right, where are we? Um, Let's see, 12. The 10 horns which you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. Reiterates it again for a little while, for a short period. Uh, There's multiple verses, uh, even all the way back there into um, Isaiah. Come, my people, close your doors. Hide yourselves in your inner rooms for a little while. The Antichrist is going to come for a brief period, three and a half years. It's a little while. It's one hour. It's a very short time. In the big picture, it's a very brief time. Um, okay, I don't know what we're on, 13. Yep. Uh, la, la, la. These have one purpose, they give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb and the lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords and king of kings and those who are with him are called the chosen and faithful. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The 10 horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. Okay, so there again, it 
reiterates what I mentioned earlier, the waters on which the woman sits represent the Gentiles, the peoples, multiple uh, people groups, the Gentiles, out of which comes this satanic uh, empire. And all these kings, their job is to give their authority to the central, central authority of the Antichrist, who is ultimately getting his authority from Satan, right? And then um, it says, then they turn on the woman and eat her and devour her. Okay, so now here is the shocking, ironic moment of the whole vision. Because as I said earlier, Sally and Mike are on their way to the bowling alley and they both have the same jackets on. And all of a sudden, Mike burns Sally and devours her. You go, whoa, what just happened? Or maybe a better example is you're a little kid, you got your little hat on and you're watching Lone Ranger and all of a sudden, Silver turns and devours the Lone Ranger and burns him. You just go, what just happened? They're supposed to be partners, they're rider and steed. All of a sudden, the beast devours the woman. So they start out as a partnership, but something turns. It is intended to be shocking. It's intended to be ironic. Again, they're, they're in the same uniform and everything. And this is, by the way, in my book, Mystery Babylon, um, what I do is I work through the text and then I lay out all of the different historical options and I say, here's the strengths and here's the weaknesses. Here's the strengths of Rome, here's the weaknesses. Here's the strengths of USA, here's the weaknesses. And then in the third part of the book, what I offer is another possibility, another interpretation. From the video, you got a hint. I'm saying that the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the city of Mecca, the city of Mecca being the greatest city of idolatry, of false religion, and the womb, the, the fountain from which has spread all of this violent, radical Islam all over the earth. And the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is the financial well, is the financial fountain. They are funding it, they are spreading it. If there's a mosque here in Phoenix, it was paid for by the family known as the Saudi royal family. Okay, so they are the source of it all. And if that's the case, then this coming Antichrist coalition will turn on and attack Saudi Arabia. And what's interesting is you have multiple passages, for instance, in Ezekiel 38, 39, which talks about this invasion of Israel. And there's this protest that rises up and it says Sheba and Dedan will lift up their voice and say, are you coming to invade a land of unwalled villages? Well, Sheba and Dedan is Saudi Arabia. So it seems as though even though Saudi Arabia has been the source and the, found the fountain, and, it, and historically has been the, the geographic fountain from which Islam's burst forth into the world, the time is coming when this coming coalition is gonna turn on Saudi Arabia. And even just geopolitically right now, that makes sense because Saudi Arabia is aligning with Israel, because they have this mutual threat of Iran, and they also have a conflict with Turkey. And, um, and so there's the geopolitical landscape, even right now, is sort of falling into alignment with sort of the, this picture, if indeed Saudi Arabia, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and Mecca is indeed that which uh, John is talking about. You said something interesting too after 9-11, the airspace, everyone had to shut down their planes Except for the Saudi royals, yeah. So here was 9-11 for three days. The whole United States, everything was shut down. The only people that were allowed to fly, not U.S. congressmen, not, except for the president, and Saudi royals. Saudi royals had freedom to fly all they wanted. And yet, what is it? Something of the 19 hijackers were Saudi citizens. And by the way, there's like 30,000 Saudi royals. So it wasn't just like four or five guys. There's probably hundreds here in the United States. And they were given the only people in the whole country that were given exemption. The money, you know, if you start talking about the amount of money, and I'm on really dangerous ground here, by the way, because I, um, I, I travel to Saudi Arabia. So it, I've been trying to lay, <laughs> lay low on talking about some of this stuff. But things are changing in Saudi Arabia right now with um, the current Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. But historically, the amount of money that the Saudis have put into, literally the back pockets of presidents, you can go down the list. You know, when the Clintons opened up their, their monies when Hillary was running, it was to the tune of like $33 million. Now, the Saudis don't donate $33 million because they just are really passionate about the Clinton initiative. <laughs> They just really are passionate about, you know, AIDS in Africa or wh whatever. And of course, or they really want to pay for Monica's wedding. But this is a whole other issue. But because um, only 5% of all their 
monies went to the actual foundation, the rest were all administrative. Can you imagine? Yeah. Um, but in any case, whether it be the Clintons, whether it be the Bushes, because the Bushes were 10 times worse. Between the father and the son, they received one and a half billion dollars directly from the Saudis. Like the country? Like we're not talking personally. The family. Really? Yeah, the family is the country. There's nothing in the history of wor the world that has had more influence over the most powerful people in the world. You go back to Jimmy Carter. He was like the main guy on his board for his library. Um, are, there's two of them actually. One was the former king of Saudi Arabia. The other one is this businessman from Saudi Arabia. And they bailed him out, you know. It's amazing when you do a study of the amount of money and, and people go, well, there's, there's a problem with lobbying in Washington. You could take all of the lobbies in Washington and combine them and they don't begin to compare to the amount of money that the Saudis, and this is not, this is direct payments through, you know, foundations and friendly loans and all types of things. Um, and uh, oh, Didn't they own Fox for a while or a portion, a big portion of Fox News? Prince Al Walid bin Talal, who's the wealthiest of all the Saudi princes, was the largest shareholder in Fox News. And he's also the second largest shareholder in Twitter. And, and, um, See, these are things we don't know, and we just have to know this stuff. Like, we have to look at... When I was in... What was his name? I, uh, Prince Al Walid bin Talal. So, but now, yeah. the crown, crown prince, bin, Mohammed bin Salman, who's now going to be the king, he put him in, in jail for like six months and confiscated half his money. So, I actually really like this guy, Mohammed bin Salman. I think that the current uh, government is trying to moderate, and, and they're moving in a very positive, very positive direction. When I was on Fox News with Glenn Beck um, just after um, the Arab Spring broke out in 2011. So a lot of people joke and say that I was the guy that got Glenn Beck kicked off of Fox. Um, he had me on and it was prime time, you know, like five o'clock. It was the biggest thing everybody was watching at the time. And he had me on talking about this stuff, the Antichrist. And I sat down in the office with the producer and I said, look, I said, I know Mohammed bin Salman. I mean, I'm sorry. Um, uh, uh, Glenn. No, the other prince, um, Al Walid bin Talal. It's easy. Um, Al Walid bin Talal is the largest shareholder in in News Corp, which is the parent company of Fox. I said, "Has this ever been a problem for you?" And he goes, "Not yet." And then we did we did our show, and it was like weeks later that he was and off. You came down on Saudi Arabia at this particular time. Is that what you? Uh, no, what you were I was about? I was just in Saudi Arabia early this year, and I'll be there again in a few months. And. Um, yeah, we need you safe because we have that's, to make our That's videos. a whole other issue. But anyway, that, that's why I want to be clear. I really like the current government of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm, I mean that for real. Well, I think he really does mean that too. That, okay, we, we're never getting through this. We have five minutes. Okay, what, what do we need to say past this? Where are we? 17? Oh, we actually long. got most of the important stuff, so that's good. Okay. Um, for, okay, so let's go 17. Uh, la, 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 la. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose, by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. The woman who you saw is the great city, which reigns over the kings of the earth. Um, and then we'll go into the next chapter, verse 1. Oh, maybe if I can, like, actually do this right. Now we're on Revelation 18 really quick. Um, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. The earth was um, illumined with his glory. He cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit, prison of every unclean and hateful bird. Just keep going. Uh, For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her. The merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. The petrodollar has been one of the most influential forces in the earth over the past few generations, and it's caused people to commit fornication, if you will, with, with the, this geopolitical entity and to even sell out their own countries and allow for the spread of this radical form of Islam all over the earth that we're seeing the results of right now. 9-11 is a result of that compromise. ISIS is a result of that compromise. Al-Qaeda, all of these have come out of this, this illicit relationship. Uh, verse 4, um, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive her plagues. Uh, for her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as um, even she has paid, and give her back double according to her deeds in the cup which she has mixed, mixed twice as much for her. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree given to give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and I'm not a widow and will never be seen 
See morning. Other translations say because she lived luxuriously, and the kings of the earth lived luxuriously with her, and you know again that that lines up. Ultimately, she's judged by God um, in in payment for all that she's caused all over the earth. She will be judged. She will be wiped out forever. And it kind of goes on. She'll become a haunt of desert jackals and owls, a perpetual di- waste of smoke rising forever. And it's very important to say this is the main reason why Jerusalem, this could not be talking about Jerusalem, because a lot of people say, well, Jerusalem is going to be annihilated, and they'll point to some parallels in Revelation. Well, Jerusalem's called the great city. She's called the great city. I go, yeah, but that's where the similarities stop. They go, well, Jerusalem is responsible for the shed blood of a lot of the prophets. And I go, yeah, in history she was, but... Jesus is going to come back and rule from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is called the city that the Lord has placed his name upon. How can you say this is the very place that God is going to rule the earth from and also say it's going to be a perpetual smoking heap? That just doesn't work. Mm-hmm. All right. So the rest of it. Oh, we're almost done. Okay, we'll do that really fast. What are we on? Eight. Um... Oh my gosh. The merchants of the earth basically lament her loss, which emphasizes the fact that she is not simply an idolatrous entity, but she is an economic entity. That they lament the loss of their sales, of their income, their wares. Again, Saudi Arabia um, is a consumer nation. It produces two things, oil up and up until now, radical Islam and it exports those all over the world. Everything they do, they buy, they purchase. They don't manufacture cars, you know, they buy everything. And so when this entity is destroyed, they're primarily lamenting their loss in revenue. And so these are the two primary things that we're looking at. False, well, three things. False religion, responsible for the shed blood, responsible for the martyrdom of God's people, and a profound economic powerhouse. These three things together in the last days, and it's an ultimate final version of historical Babylon. It's an ultimate final version of historical Rome. In the first century, Rome was the Babylon of the first century, but in the last days, it's something else. And so Satan's headquarters, his stronghold, has migrated throughout history, but he's always migrated. He's always had a very clear geographic stronghold from which he spews out his deception, his lies, his influence all over the world. And if we're to say, what is that primary fountainhead today, then I think it it seems we have a pretty good candidate. Let's put it that way. I don't like to be dogmatic on this because something else could emerge, but at least right now, I think we have a pretty good candidate right in front of us. Okay. You can read the rest of the chapter on your own. How's that? Uh, and now we're going to like take our 10-minute break. We're going to come back and talk about what is so cool, the thousand-year reign of Jesus, because that's what this is all about. Revelation is all about coming, and nobody's ready for it, and no one thinks it's exciting, and we're going to make it exciting. How's that?